Alan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Lisa Drakeman. I see we have the Princeton Tiger. You bet I do. Um, right. I forget. That's, why, that's why they call it Tiger Town. Uh, they made this for something. I don't remember what. Um, but it's a great background. And there's a black version with an orange tiger. So whatever your decor, it will well, that works. Uh, that works very well indeed. Yeah. I had the privilege of reading your Gettysburg Last Invasion book. Um, it really brought that battle to life, maybe oh, more than I wanted it to. It's so oh. vivid. Uh, the, I can't imagine the amount of work you have done, the, the, the materials that you researched and read. And, or, and I was trying to think about whether you had this gigantic timeline somewhere that where you wrote everything down by, you know, almost minute by minute. Well... It was only three days, <laughs> so you could track a lot, and other, and there was an awful lot going on in those three days. So it provi <coughs> it provided a lot of material, but it was it was a great thing to write because very largely because I was sitting right there <coughs> writing it, and one of the great advantages of actually living as I was doing in Gettysburg was that you you knew the contours of the ground. You huh. had been across it, you've seen it the way that they saw it then. So that when you read people's accounts of the battle, you were able to look and say, yes, I know where that's, that is. And I know what they could see from that vantage point and also what they couldn't see. I know what, I would know how the ground lies. Wow. So you could talk about these undulating waves of, mm -hmm. of ridges because that's really the first thing that strikes you about uh, the terrain at Gettysburg. That's something you can't get just from looking at a map. Mm -hmm. So when you're actually there, you, you, you get a feel for it, and then you can write about it as, uh, as, as, as a place that you've, you've walked over and mm -hmm. you, you've been around and know. So there was, uh, there was, there was a challenge in it, but it was also a very satisfying uh, thing uh, to, uh, to write. So I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did, and, and I just want to welcome Rich Thomas from the great class of 66. Rich <laughs> is our, our local Hilton Head um, Civil War expert. He conducts tours. He's taking the club on a tour. Um, and I know that he's also read a lot of your work. I, we were just talking about the Gettysburg book, and I was hearing a little bit about the process of how it came together, because I could not imagine how you organized that much detail and, and, and made it so real. Part of, part of the key is a very old fashioned way of doing things. And that is <laughs> four by six cards. <laughs> yep. Actually, I, Nothing believe like them. <laughs> I think they're very helpful. I, um, all, the, all the research material goes on to four by six cards, not three by fives, they're, those are too small, mm -hmm. uh, four by sixes. Yeah. And they go into then into boxes, and there's a sense in which, after I've accumulated a certain number of them, it's like water building up behind the dam, hmm. and you feel okay. Now it's time to to get this organized. Now it's time to start writing these things. But I think I must have, oh, I don't know, at least four, maybe five boxes of these uh, four by six cards just for the Gettysburg book. Mm. When you go through them, you find out that you use maybe 15%. Mm. Uh, but you've, you've got to do the basic, uh, the basic work that way. You've got to read the sources. You've got to go track down archival materials. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, you're really going to end up saying nothing that people haven't already said. And I wanted to try to look at things as fresh, with as fresh eyes as possible. Um, there was something of the same challenge with the Lee book, mm -hmm. which is, and, and it's Lee, I think I'm going to talk about uh, today, mm. that um, one of the problems about Lee was that the man was a compulsive letter writer. Huh. The problem is that the letters are not in a single collection. There's not just one place you can go to and, and access them easily. They are scattered in penny packets all across the country, literally. Mm. So I, I've got stuff that I accessed from the Morgan Library in New York City all the way to the Huntington Library in San Marino and, and points in between. And, and even, ironically, on a lot of auction websites. 
because there's a lot of Lee material that's still in private hands. And it shows up on eBay or it shows up on heritage auctions. And it's not that I can afford to buy these things, mind you, they, they cost a good deal, but the people who maintain the sites will put a transcript of the letter on the website so that prospective buyers can read it. Well, that's a gift to me because that's really what I want. I don't want the letter, I want the contents of it. So I'm able to access it through, the, through things like that. But it's, you, you have to have what an old teacher of mine once called Sitzfleisch. And I think you can translate that without needing to know German. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's a certain element of persistence that you, you have to have. You really have to be dogged about tracking things down. But when you do, it's very rewarding. Well, we're really looking forward to today. I saw your note to Don that you said Lee came close to Hilton Head. Yes, he did. Point. Yes. And actually on two occasions in his life. Uh, one, he was directly in um, the Port Royal area. Uh, and that was when he was sent there in the winter of, uh, of 1861 to 62 by Jefferson Davis to take charge of the defenses uh, in... Uh, along the Georgia coast and South Carolina coast. It was not a particularly rewarding experience for him because there weren't a lot in the way of, of resources for him to deploy. And the governor of South Carolina was not particularly cooperative. Hmm. And it was, it was a frustrating time. It was not a good use of his talents. And I think he was more than a little relieved when in the spring of 1862, Davis recalls him to Richmond and makes him, uh, first of all, a military advisor and then puts him into direct military command. But he spent several months uh, around uh, the, the Port Royal area and, uh, and around Charleston. And uh, I don't know that he accomplished a great deal. It was, it was very frustrating, but he was there. Now that was later in his life no one earlier time that he's there it's when he's fresh out of west point and his first posting in the corps of engineers um was uh, was to the savannah river and the construction of what today we now know as fort pickens now that's not exactly port royal and hilton head but it's eh, it's reasonably close and uh, that meant that he was in that area for about a year, trying to supervise the initial phases of construction on what was then called Cockspur Island in the estuary of the Savannah River. And it was, uh, it was there he made some lifelong friends. Uh, the Mackay family of Savannah are, were people he stayed in touch with for the rest of his life. So he had, uh, he had two turns, you might say, in that area. He made a third visit in the last year of his life. And this was in accompaniment with, uh, with one of his daughters. Uh, he's making a visit to South Carolina and Florida, largely for his health, because his, his, his heart was in a very fragile condition. And he went south for the, the warmth and in, in some respects, the relaxation. Think of him as the first snowbird and um, he goes there and visits, the only time in his life that we know for sure, that he visits his father's grave. Hmm. Uh, his father, Light Horse Harry, was buried on Cumberland Island, which is off the Georgia, the Georgia coast. And thereby hangs a tale, which I'll tell you more about as we get into uh, talking about Lee uh, this afternoon. But yeah, that's, that's a very complicated story. But it's the only time he visits his father's grave. It's easy to understand, given that the father basically left the family behind, isn't it? Oh, he did. Yeah. Light Horse Harry. Oh, yes. An abundantly talented soldier of the revolution whose talents, unfortunately, did not extend beyond the revolution. There, I think there are people like that. that like They're really well suited to combat, and it's much harder for them to adjust to... Uh, yeah more regular the, life this was this was the sad story of a number of of these talented men who serve around washington during the revolution and some of them go on to great things like hamilton uh others of them just 
They just never fit back into a convenient space in life. And um, and Light Horse Harry was one. And Light Horse Harry was one. <laughs> What are we looking at as the size of the group that we're going to be um, having today? I, I think we should see maybe including some people where there are, there are two people watching on one screen, mm -hmm. probably around 25. Oh, so that's it great. Like they're all starting to sign in now. Oh, I see. Yes. Here comes everyone. Yeah. And I see Don Drakeman there too. Yes. Hi, Alan. Uh, thanks so much for, for doing this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Really yeah. We're doing it. I see so many are, are flying There's Prince Nelson no colors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The orange and black on uh, on display. We oh. try to do that when we have our events. I, I have I have a Princeton bow tie. Now, can I do a bow tie? I'm sorry. I've I've never really been able to figure I mean, what, the physics of a bow tie. I've never really been able to master. That. So I'm unfortunately I'm not wearing up. I'm not wearing up. So that, you can always get the cheap version. Oh, I'm not going for some reason. Hi, Steve. How are you today? Great. How are you doing? Great. How are you Very doing? well. Very well. Can you guys hear an echo? Can when you I guys call? hear an echo when I call? Yes. 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 To do that. To do that. Don, how far Don, away are you? Maybe not far enough. I will move. I will okay. move. Yeah, because he's. We, uh, yeah. we may want to have people go on mute and sure. leave me as the only talker until we get to question time. That might solve the problem about echo, because it seems like someone's microphone is picking up everything that they're saying. And I think Don and I are too. What everyone else is saying. Yeah, oh, it's getting better. He might have turned his off. Uh, we were fine until Don signed I in. Until Don, we're too close together. Hi, Peter. Hi, Risa. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Hi. So Steve is going to be our cane recipient today. Why don't we talk a little bit about that uh, while people are still signing in? We have a very special tradition here in Hilton Head, I think, as people Hilton know, Hilton. that began when Pete Canan. Uh, from our Hilton Head Club was the Cane Bearer at Reunions two years in a row in 2014 and 15. And we created we a cane created in his memory, his memory. The echo again, which we call the which we call Memorial King. Memorial King. And we award this to the oldest we member of the, the oldest, oldest class at an event. Oldest class at an event. So I'm gonna hold it up so, so you guys can see the beautiful silver tiger head. And Steve is going to somehow reach for it, I think. There you go. So thank you, Steve, for being our cane bearer. You for the great class of 56. So we're so glad that you're here today. You're today. Will, I, will, will there be a day in which I can actually put it in my hand if I, in fact, I am the oldest attendee? That's right. Now, you do have to give it now back at the end of the event. At the end of the event. <laughs> So I'm not sure why I'm. So I'm not sure why I'm still echoing. Still echoing. Well, I think Greg is up. I think Greg is up with his mic and with so his mic and never, everybody should be on mute. Everybody should be. Oh, so everyone's um, everyone is echoing now. So we will all mute. Let's we'll give it. Um, let's give it. Um, maybe two more minutes. Um, as we're expecting some more people. Let's see. We should have um, close to 20 sign-ins, I think. Oh, while I have everybody here, we're having terrible weather tomorrow. Um, thunderstorms, 90% chance. So we have this great tour plan, which Rich is going to lead us on. We're, uh, we're going to see the, the forts that they're still remaining here on Hilton Head, among other things, which is gonna tell us their history. Uh, so we have decided to change the tour date to March 26th, that's a Sunday, same time. So uh, two weeks away and from 1 p.m. we'll still meet in Port Royal. If you're signed up, I'll make sure and send everybody a note also. 
Uh, we are fully booked for that tour. We're actually oversubscribed. So we will look forward to seeing everybody, not tomorrow, but on March 26th. And I'll remind everybody again at the end. Now the echoes have stopped, maybe with everybody muting. Okay. All right, we usually give it uh, till five after. That's two more minutes. Anybody else have anything to tell us about what's going on in their Princeton or other lives? Class of uh, 07, my son's class, they're all in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota for the last of the freshman family of Holder uh, that are still pals forever. And the last of their class group is uh, got married yesterday. Oh, wow. It, and uh, the reason why it had to be in her hometown of Minneapolis uh, was because Today, everybody's going ice fishing. <laughs> so they're about, uh, I think about 25 invited and about 20 of them are all Princeton class of 07. So that's what's happening in my world. That's <laughs> I was going to be granny nanny, but they didn't take the baby. So oh, <laughs> that would have been fun. Yeah, yeah. Our boys, uh, what Peter? Uh, two announcements. Um, okay. Our class of 1967 is having what is called a, a mega mini reunion in Nashville uh, in the middle of April. Uh, at least 50 classmates are gathering there and got a whole slew of events scheduled for us. So it should be a really good long weekend. The other news, the other news is that uh, Pam and I are hosting one of the student competitors in the international piano competition, a uh, young lady originally from Shanghai, China, but uh, she's lived in England for the last five years going to a specialty um, music school. And as a matter of fact, she's practicing right now. And uh, so the first four rounds will be at St. Luke's Church morning, uh, sorry, afternoon and evenings on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with a finals next Saturday night at First Presbyterian Church. So I encourage you to uh, join us. Uh, these, this is the younger group, but uh, they alternate each year. This is from about 13 to 16 or so, uh, but they're still really, really talented musicians. I think there were over 100 who um, sent in tapes to see if they could qualify. There are 19 of them here. So that's really great that you're involved directly with that. It must be fun to have them. It's like when the footnotes come. They're so full of life and energy. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. Okay. Just to build on Peter's comment and announcement that the great class of 66 is following the lead of our younger uh, schoolmates in holding a, we're not sure what to call it yet, Peter. We're not calling it a mega mini reunion yet, but it's an off year reunion. That'll be held here on Hilton Head at the end of October this this, this fall. We're in the uh, final planning uh, stages of that right now. So are we going to see you just all over the island dressed in black and orange? More than likely. <laughs> well, I'm going to be watching for that. It'll be like finding Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's about five after. And I would, I'm really excited that we're having this wonderful event today. For those of you who signed a little late, Steve Alford is our cane bearer from the great class of 66 for this event. But please join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Gelzo. He is the director of the Initiative on Politics and Statesmanship of Princeton's James Madison program. He's a New York Times bestseller for Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, He's also won many prizes, including the Lincoln Prize twice for his writings about the Civil War. You can look at the invitation that we sent you. There is a link to his webpage where you can find more details about his work. But we are exceptionally fortunate to be able to have Dr. Gelzo join us today because, of course, we have such interesting ties to the Civil War here on Hilton Head. Obviously, it was pivotal because it was captured so early in the war. So with that, I will hand over to Dr. Gelzo. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa. It is interesting indeed to remember that Hilton Head really did have a Civil War history and quite a remarkable mm -hmm. one. 
uh, beginning as early as November of 1861, when the Union Navy, without invitation, of course, steams into the Port Royal Sound, takes over the islands and the surrounding territory, and really makes this a Union-occupied coastal strip for the entire rest of the war. All kinds of interesting experiments take place here, because when the Union forces seize control of the Sound, uh, they basically chase off all the major plantation owners in the area. That leaves all the slaves on those plantations still in place. In large measure, they really take over uh, farming and, uh, and selling the goods that they're able to produce all through the war. And there's a, a, a very aggressive argument that's made that there should be some kind of division of these old plantation lands among the newly emancipated slaves. Well, that becomes a story that then extends into reconstruction. It doesn't end happily for most of the people who are involved, but that's not actually the story I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to stay within the confines of the Civil War because what I will talk about is what I've most recently written about, and that is Robert E. Lee. Although Lee has a connection with the Port Royal Sound and with Hilton Head, uh, and on a number of occasions, and I'll just mention this briefly, and Lisa and I were talking about this just before everyone uh, arrived, and that is in the winter of 1861 to 62, Robert E. Lee was sent south to Charleston to take charge of the defenses of the coastal, the Carolina coastal uh, area. And the Port Royal Sound fell within that. He made a number of visits here. He set up a temporary headquarters and he had oversight of this area. It was not very exciting. No significant battle was fought under Lee's direction, but he was in charge for several months in this area before in the spring of 1862, he's recalled to Richmond and then embarks on the career that makes him the famous commander uh, of the Civil War era. So there's a Robert E. Lee connection from the Civil War with that area. He actually had another early connection right at the start of his career in the Corps of Engineers when he was assigned as an engineering, as a junior engineering officer, uh, to the construction of what is today known as Fort Pickens in the estuary of the Savannah River. Uh, they were then building on what they called Cockspur Island. Well, he had oversight of the original layout and construction of that fortification and was uh, in charge of that for some two years until he's reassigned to yet another place. This is what the army does to you. You're in one place. And then after a short time, you get assigned to another and then another and another. And uh, you might say that he really began his army career in the general area of uh, the Carolina coast and the Savannah River estuary. He makes a last visit in the last year of his life to Cumberland Island, which is where his father, the famous Light Horse Harry, uh, was buried. That's actually the only occasion in which he visits his father's grave. So Lee made a number of forays in the area, uh, one of them extended. So there's a, there's a certain Robert E. Lee connection with the area that all of you are presently located in. And uh, perhaps that will also show up as uh, you're doing the tour of the Port Royal Sound and the Hilton Head area. But for the moment, I thought I would talk for a little while about Robert E. Lee himself. I mean, in a certain sense, you can hardly talk about the Civil War and not talk about Robert E. Lee. I've been talking about the Civil War for low these many years. Most of the time when I've talked about it, it's about Abraham Lincoln. Most of the work I've done has been involved in Abraham Lincoln and research into Lincoln. And I've also written on other aspects of the Civil War and its campaigns. But most recently, uh, in uh, the fall of 2021, I published a biography of Robert E. Lee, in large measure because this Yankee from Yankee Land uh, really wanted to take a look at the Civil War era from the other end of the telescope. I had really been looking at the Civil War as a Northerner, a Pennsylvanian, and I thought it would be interesting to see what it might look like from a Southern perspective. And it certainly was interesting. So let me see if I can take you onto the inside of that interesting view 
of Robert E. Lee. For a long time, it was not difficult to do this speaking about Robert E. Lee, because for almost a century after his death in 1870, Lee was really embalmed in American memories, in books, in postage stamps, in school exercises. He was held out as a blend of nobility and sorrow, second only to, to Washington or to Lincoln, and in some places, not even second to them. He was depicted as the chivalrous knight of the lost cause. He was depicted as the exemplar of pure devotion to duty. When uh, Virginia seceded from the Union in 1861, his first biographer, James McCabe, said that Lee's course was plain. Uh, though his own judgment assured him it would bring great suffering and disaster upon his state, Lee was convinced that it was his duty to obey the command of Virginia without questioning it. Even in defeat, Lee was held up as the emblem of duty. John William Jones, another biographer of Lee, declared in his book, after the surrender, Lee determined it was his duty to remain in his native state, to share her fortunes, and abide all the perils of personal danger which then seemed to surround him. So he's, a, he's an exemplar of duty. He was also in the gaze of another, yet another biographer, John Eston Cook. He was the, the paragon of moral integrity. Cook said that Lee's erect and graceful figure revealed his elevated character, the consciousness of command, a species of moral and official grandeur, which it was impossible to mistake. Lee was also depicted as the model of the 19th century's Christian soldier. Uh, Lee, as one of his officers said after Lee's death, Lee followed his God above every other earthly consideration with a native modesty which surrounds now his entire character and career with a halo of unfading light, almost sainthood. Above all, Lee was held up as the peerless strategist and tactician, the general who was never defeated except when he was finally ground down by the odds. Uh, Great Britain's most modern of modern major generals, Sir Garnet Wolseley, told the New York Sun in 1887 that Lee's combinations to secure victory were the conceptions of a truly great strategist. But when they had been effected, his tactics were then almost everything that could be desired up to the moment of victory. Well, victory, of course, was what in the end eluded Robert E. Lee. And to the skeptical among us, these heaps of adulation for Lee can easily look like clever inventions that Southerners created to compensate for the fact that they lost, that theirs was really not a very well-managed cause, that it was done on behalf of a morally repellent principle, which is human chattel slavery. And yet these hymns of praise for Robert E. Lee are not entirely or, or even mostly inventions. Uh, descriptions of Lee as a cadet at West Point in the 1820s. They teem with the vocabulary of perfection. Lee graduates with no conduct demerits. He misses graduating at the head of his class by mere decimal points in the numerical grading system. He's appointed class adjutant, which was then the highest student rank at the academy. As a staff officer in the Mexican War, Lee catapults upwards in the esteem of Winfield Scott, who commanded the great expedition that captured Mexico City. He becomes Scott's most trusted subordinate. And in the, the post-war years, Scott would claim more than once that his success was largely due to the skill, valor, and undaunted energy of Robert E. Lee. In 1861, Lee declines field command of the federal armies that were being organized to subdue the Confederacy. 
And he admits that I look upon secession as anarchy and on slavery as so repellent that if I owned the four millions of slaves in the South, I would sacrifice them all to the Union. But Lee pleads, how can I draw my sword upon Virginia, my native state? All through the declining fortunes of the Confederacy, Lee remains as emotionally stable as Keats's patient, sleepless Aramite. In the end, Lee decides to surrender his army rather than turn it loose as an insurgency. And he agrees to the humble task of serving as president of a small, near bankrupt college in the upper Shenandoah, Washington College, now Washington and Lee University. In the ultimate tribute, men name their sons for him. Robert Lee Jones, the actor. Robert Lee Smith, the maternal grandfather of Elvis Presley. Above all, Robert Lee Frost, the poet. In, 1859, in 1959, Robert Penn Warren had to confess to a sense of bafflement at Lee. He said that Lee was as smooth as an egg, like a sainted grandmother with no detectable flaws. All the same, though, we, we have come lately to doubt much of the Lee story. We've begun to entertain suspicions about his military capacity, because if there's one thing you don't do in American culture, it's lose. We have developed still more doubts about Lee's nobility of character, especially on the subject of race, since Lee never surrendered the Southern white belief in the inferiority of black people as a race. And we're no longer so sure about the smoothness of the Lee Eggs character, because after the war, his letters just foam with rage against Reconstruction. In fact, we're not sure if we can speak of Robert E. Lee at all. And the rash of Lee statue topplings and removals since 2017, uh, those are signs of, of how little privilege remains attached to the name of Robert E. Lee. In the process of destroying a myth, it's always possible to create a counter myth, which turns out to be just as vulnerable to question as its original. It is true, we've begun to realize that Robert E. Lee was a deeply conflicted man, but the conflicts turn out to be more varied than we expected. To begin with, there's this long shadow cast over Lee by his father, the, the over-celebrated Revolutionary War cavalryman, Light Horse Harry Lee. It's a shadow cast by absence, because Light Horse Harry proved to be as spectacularly inept as a property owner and politician and head of household as he once had been spectacularly talented on the battlefields of the Revolution. Investments in real estate speculations burned up his first wife's cash. And when she died and he remarried to Ann Hill Carter, he burned up her cash as well. By 1811, Lighthorse Harry had moved his family to the easier circumstances of Alexandria. But as a Federalist, he was now embroiled in political conflicts with Virginia's Jeffersonians. After a near fatal beating in a political riot, he announced his departure to the West Indies, ostensibly in search of health, but in fact, in search of escape from his creditors and his political enemies. Robert, his youngest son, was six years old when his father departed and never laid eyes on him again. Anybody who would like to measure the impact of that loss can do so simply by noticing that for more than 40 years, from 1825 until well after the Civil War and nearly his death, in a correspondence that amounted to thousands of letters, Robert E. Lee never once mentioned his father. 
The miserable example of Light Horse Harry stimulated a determination in Robert Lee to practice a kind of redemptive perfection, as if to wipe out all record of his father's failures. Even more drove him to a pursuit of independence, partly from his father's reputation, but also from dependence on any other people who might also fail him. I am fond of independence, Lee wrote to his own eldest son, Custis Lee. It is that feeling that prompts me to come up strictly to the requirements of law and regulations. I wish neither to seek or receive indulgence from anyone. I wish to feel under obligation to no one. But alongside that passion for independence, Lee was whipsawed by a passion for security, the security his father had robbed him of, a passion that leads him to marry into the Custis family and to remain in the army, even when he was frequently, as he said, waiting, looking, and hoping for some good opportunity to bid an affectionate farewell to my Uncle Sam. These conflicting impulses set up extraordinary emotional riptides in Lee's life. Robert E. Lee never owns a house of his own. He makes his home with his in-laws at Arlington after marrying Mary Custis in 1831. But then he spends most of his life between then and 1861 on duty elsewhere at Fort Monroe, St. Louis, Fort Hamilton, Mexico, Fort Carroll, West Point as superintendent, and then Texas. He chooses to serve the Confederacy in 1861, but he is its most unsparing critic during the Civil War. It's only in the years after the war, when he's the president of Washington College, that Lee is able to achieve any significant resolution of these conflicts, largely because as president, and look, as General Lee, Nobody, trustees or faculty or students, nobody was in any position to disagree with him. He dismissed the college rule book. He informed incoming students, and he would interview every new student coming into the college. He told them in, in what seems like on the surface, a stroke of generosity, that we have no printed rules. We have but one rule here, and it is that every student must be a gentleman. That really sounds generous. But far from generosity, what this meant in practice was that Robert E. Lee was the judge, jury, and executioner of what composed a gentleman. No wonder then that the Washington College years, the last five years of his life, were probably the happiest years of that life. He may not have been exaggerating when he shocked one Washington College student by remarking that the great mistake of my life was taking a military education. Well, mistake or not, it is true that Robert E. Lee was a perceptive strategist, but not quite in the way we usually imagine. Lee was, after all, trained as an engineer, which in the 1820s was the goal that a West Point education largely trained everybody under its rule for. Lee spent most of his career building or rebuilding things, fortifications in Baltimore and New York City, the St. Louis Wharves. And so it comes as a surprise to realize that Robert E. Lee never commanded troops in combat until the very verge of the Civil War. Even there, Lee's real gift was not hands-on tactical leadership. His aide-de-camp and secretary, Walter Taylor, wrote years later that General Lee always accorded his corps commanders great liberty in the exercise of their discretion as to the manner of the execution of his orders. Having made clear his general plans, he left to them the details of carrying them out. He was not a micromanager. 
Instead, Lee's mind ran toward big picture, strategic concepts. And the direction those concepts took was at variance with a lot of the thinking of the Confederate leadership. Lee had spent a surprisingly large portion of his engineering career in the North. And for that reason, he understood clearly that the South was too woefully under-resourced to accomplish any kind of great military triumph. If the Confederates were to win their independence, they'd have to, to get in and score a quick knockout. And the way to do that was to leap to the offensive, surprise the North, carry the war North, make war on Northern public opinion, convince Northerners that they could not win and thus force the Lincoln administration to the negotiating table. Otherwise, Lee said, if Confederate armies merely sat on their haunches, sat on the defensive, tried to protect their logistical centers, federal armies would simply clamp sieges around their cities, and that would be the end. This advice is, is utterly at variance with what you might expect from the only army engineer to attain senior command of armies in the field in the Civil War. I mean, his nearest competition among engineers was George Gordon Meade. For that reason, it's become common for people to look for an explanation of Lee's aggressiveness in some hidden quirk of his character, as though something of the fabled Light Horse Harry's reckless disposition had, had been passed on in the gene pool to his son. But Robert E. Lee's audacity on the offensive really sat at a considerable distance from just unreasoning instinct, just throwing the ball. And this was something which Lee himself explained to William Allen in the years after the war. No one, Lee said, no one who takes big chances and fails ever gets points afterwards for wisdom. Such criticism is obvious, Lee said, but the disparity of force between the contending forces rendered the risks unavoidable. Lee was, after all, not only an engineer, he was the observer of Winfield Scott's lightning offensive toward Mexico City in 1847. Lee's offensive mindedness was a much more calculated product of Winfield Scott's example than some crazy instinct inherited from Light Horse Harry. Mentioning Winfield Scott in connection with Lee is a reminder that a great deal of the myth-making and remaking about Lee emerges from the four years of his life as a Confederate general. And given the fact that his historical reputation rests almost completely on what Lee did in those four years of the Civil War, that's not necessarily a mistake. But it is nevertheless curious how overwhelmingly biographers have concentrated on the Civil War years and missed the cues to understanding Lee that are embedded in the 54 years that preceded them. For instance, Clifford Dowdy, the author of a highly readable 1965 biography of Lee, that biography amounts to 734 pages. Of them, Dowdy uses just 135 pages to get to the Civil War. And then he squeezes the Washington College years into the last 84. So it's mostly a book about Lee and the Civil War. The Mount Everest of Lee biography, which is Douglas Southall Freeman's R.E. Lee. That sprawls across four volumes that Freeman published in the 1930s. But we get to the Civil War just two thirds of the way through volume one. And Freeman only has Lee arriving at Washington College as late as halfway through volume four. Everything else is the Civil War. Now, maybe this is just a reflection of the fact that Lee's pre-war and post-war careers, frankly, made for less than interesting reading or research. But it's also possible that the non-Civil War parts of his life are actually more difficult for biographers to square with the myths and the remyths. 
So take this as a question. Was Robert E. Lee indeed the paragon of moral integrity? Well, in many ways, yes. John Schofield, who was a cadet at West Point during Lee's superintendency there in the 1850s, remembered Lee as the personification of dignity, justice, and kindness, the ideal of a commanding officer. But other cadets found Robert Lee to be a stiffly pressed, perfection demanding iron pants. And behind his back, they sang songs decrying the merits of old Bob Lee and stating his cruelties to cadets. And although Lee himself never seems to have owned more than one slave family inherited from his mother, he benefited from the labors of the nearly 200 others owned by his in-laws. And in a damaging incident published across the country in 1859, he had three fugitives from Arlington whipped. And yet these are the same slaves who in conscientious obedience to his father-in-law's will, Lee emancipates in December of 1862 at a time when no other white Southerner would have objected if he had declined to do so. Here's a second question. Was he really devoted to duty? Yes, but his decision to refuse command of federal troops in 1861 and then assume command of Virginia and then Confederate forces amounts to what I have to interpret unavoidably as treason, both in terms of the oath that he took when he was commissioned in 1829 and according to the Constitution's definition of treason, which is levying war against the United States or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. That's Article 3, Section 3. Third question, was he the humble Christian who told Beverly Tucker Lacey in 1864, I am nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for salvation? Well, certainly Lee was baptized as an Episcopalian, although no actual record of the baptism survives in the archives of the Diocese of Virginia. That's not really surprising, but still, it's not there. He was catechized as an adolescent by Bishop William Meade at Christ Church, Alexandria, but there's no hard evidence that Lee ever developed any religious sensibilities beyond that of a decent, polite, low church Virginia Episcopalian. Like many fatherless children, he grew up struggling to grasp a concept of God, and his actual references to religion are vague and, and pulseless, and on a few occasions actually comical. He was not actually confirmed in the Episcopal Church until 1855, and then largely because his teenage daughters were undergoing confirmation. And judging by their letters and journals, it has to be said that they were more pious than he was. So then a fourth question, was Lee submissive and noble in defeat? Yes, but mostly because he got terms from Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox that he could live with. His entire army was paroled and allowed to return home without molestation by federal authorities instead of being interned in prison camps or, or worse, paraded through the streets of Washington or New York like, like captives in some Roman triumph with himself and his principal officers on trial for their lives. However, his final report to Jefferson Davis after the surrender is anything but submissive because it's tinged with bitterness at his army of Northern Virginia's mortifying collapse on its retreat from Richmond. The troops, he wrote in this final report, were not marked by the boldness and decision which formerly characterized them. And all along the march, Lee complained, they appeared to him to be feeble 
and a want of confidence seemed to possess officers and men. These men, rather than displaying courage and fortitude right to the last, Lee said, threw away their arms while others followed the wagon trains and embarrassed their progress. Even they had failed his demand for perfection. How then shall we speak of Robert E. Lee? Well, I think we can say, first of all, that he was an American of great talents, especially as an engineer, but also as a military strategist. And we can say that when compared with the record of a lot of his contemporaries in America and Europe in the mid 19th century, I mean, in the Civil War, think of some of the prominent generals who were really of comparatively low mental visibility. I mean, thinking of Joe Hooker, Ambrose Burnside, I think even George McClellan. And that's not even to drag in a number of the, the Confederates who were less than shining examples of military probity, like Braxton Bragg. Put, put up on, on, a, on a lineup beside those characters, uh, Lee is extraordinary. He scales almost Napoleonic heights of accomplishment. So yes, we can say great talents especially as, as a strategist. I think we can also say that he was a traumatized child who grew up struggling to repair the damage of that trauma by seeking a perfection which demanded more of himself and of others than it was easy to achieve. I think we can also say that he was a Southerner who understood more clearly than a lot of Southerners, or at least was willing to admit it, the wrong of slavery. Even to the point of calling slavery in a letter that he wrote to his wife in 1856, a moral and political evil in any country. And yet Lee also allows himself, like a lot of other slaveholders in the upper South, he allowed himself to believe that the final abolition of human slavery would only occur in some distant future. As he put it, known and ordered by a wise and merciful providence. And that's a lot like saying, like the so-called good Germans described by W.J. Sebold. This is to say that Lee's feelings of shame and defiance impelled him to look at the evil of slavery and then to look away. Finally, I think we can say that he was a man who made the wrong decision at the most important moment of his life and who did not know how to unmake it, either then or afterwards. Robert E. Lee is a man of complications, but not complexity. I contrast him that way with Lincoln, because Lincoln is also a man of complications, but he is also a man of complexity. And the distinction that I draw there runs like this. Complications are when you do recognize a variety of competing and incommensurate interests in your life and in your surrounding society, but which you make no effort to resolve for yourself or for others. Lincoln is different. He understands the complications of his time, but he is a complex figure in that he spends so much of his life trying to work the resolutions of these complicated and competing forces, factors, and personalities. Lee is not like that. Lee is on the side just of complications, not complexity. Lee is not a tragic figure like Oedipus, whose tragedy lay, like the other classical Greek tragic figures, in not turning out to be the man he thought he was. Now that's, that's not Lee, he's not Oedipus. On the other hand, Robert E. Lee is not a villain, like Iago in Shakespeare's Othello, a character who, who mischievously and deliberately plots the humiliation and downfall and death of others. Robert E. Lee is 
rather the flawed warrior, like Achilles in the Iliad, who is driven by circumstances that he doesn't entirely understand to his own destruction. Maybe in the end, Lee had it right, that his great mistake in life had been that military education. Well, thank you very much for listening to me talk about Robert E. Lee. And I think Lisa, at this point, I'd be happy to open the floor for questions. Sorry, I had a little trouble on muting. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk and that new look at Robert E. Lee. Um, I think, you know, I grew up mostly in the South. I don't think people realize that. And all of the, the myths that you talk about, I heard quite a bit as a young person. And I think a lot of us probably did. And I actually was looking at a, um, a painting recently of the surrender and they, and Lee is in the front of the painting and he's a colossus compared to this sort of insignificant figure of Grant, mm -hmm. which is just interesting because of course that doesn't reflect what was happening in the moment. No. Um, you know, so, when it, when it, Lisa, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because it, there's an interesting detail about this. Uh, Lee, Lee was probably just under six feet tall. Mm -hmm. He was a big man. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily look that way because all of his height was really in his trunk rather than his legs. Um, that's that's a contrast with Lincoln. Lincoln, all of Lincoln's height was in his legs. Mm -hmm. uh, but when Lee stands up straight, it's it's the bulk of the man that you see. And it doesn't really strike you at first that this is a tremendously tall man. But if you stand him beside Ulysses Grant, yeah. Grant was five foot eight. Mm -hmm. Now that was about in 1865, your average male height, but it meant that Ulysses Grant had to look up at Robert E. Lee standing there in the McLean parlor uh, in, at Appomattox Courthouse. And, and what made it worse, of course, was that um, Lee himself was in this immaculate dress, uniform, gold sash, formal sort. He was, he was dressed for the occasion. Grant in his memoirs, talked about how embarrassed he felt because he shows up at the surrender ceremonies in, in really what amounts to a field uniform. It's, it's an ordinary soldier's sack coat with his lieutenant general's shoulder straps sewn on and his moot, boots are all muddy. And in his memoirs, Grant talks about how intimidated he felt huh. coming into Lee's presence like that. And yet there's a reason for it. And that is that Grant in pursuit of Lee's army after the fall of Richmond. I mean, and they'd been pursuing Lee for a week after the fall of Richmond. Grant's army had outpaced its supplies and its bag baggage wagons uh, to the point where Grant knew, I mean, Grant goes to the surrender ceremonies knowing full well that he's got to make Lee a deal he can't refuse because Grant's army doesn't have the wherewithal to pursue him for another day. Mm. And the reason the Grant's in this muddy uniform is because his baggage wagons are so far to the rear. And that's the basic reason for it. Now, Lee, of course, doesn't know that. Lee doesn't know that Grant's short on, on supplies. What Lee is anxious is that he's not going to go in to this discussion with Grant. And Grant's going to demand some kind of unconditional surrender, which could, in fact, lead to trials, it could lead to executions in some cases, because after all, what is what is Lee's army? It, it's not the army of a legitimate government. It's the army of an insurrection. Mm -hmm. What can you do to people like that? Almost anything you like. Well, Lee's anxious that way. So Grant has his imperative, get Lee to say yes. Lee has his imperative, get Grant to offer me terms I can accept. And the two, the two join together very nicely they are both able to walk out of that parlor at Appomattox Courthouse, content with the deal that they have. But so much was going on that nobody was talking about. It was a little bit like watching a high stakes poker game in which neither side knows what cards the other is holding. That is really interesting. Thank you for that. Let's see if we have some other questions. I don't wanna take up all the question time. You can just- I have one. Uh... Professor Gelzo, 
I've always been fascinated by the transformation that Lee undergoes during the war in terms of his orientation to uh, tactics and to strategy. And if you think about him early in the war, he earns the nickname, the King of Spades for his defensive orientation in, in West Virginia. But then we go to Chancellorsville and he takes his army and divides it not just once, but twice in the face of an overwhelming superiority of, of numbers. And what do you attribute that shift to? Well, I don't know that there's really all that much of a shift. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, when he gets the title King of Spades, not, not so much from the West Virginia campaign. The West Virginia campaign is his first serious command. People don't pay a whole lot of attention to that because it's kind of an embarrassing episode in Lee's life. Uh, he's sent to West Virginia to take charge of Confederate operations in that sector in the late summer and fall of 1861. And it's a mess. I mean, the, 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 his junior commanders, whom he doesn't know, are busy arguing with each other. He doesn't really have serious authority from Richmond to tell them what to do, to knock their heads together and to make them cooperate. Probably wouldn't have done any good if he had. And the upshot of that campaign is, is an embarrassment. Uh, this is why he gets recalled to Richmond, and this is why Jefferson Davis sends him down to uh, Hilton Head and Port Royal, sends him down to Carolina because uh, the campaign in Western Virginia was a botch. It's only when he comes back to Richmond and the commander of the Confederate forces around Richmond, Joseph Johnston, is seriously wounded at the end of May 1862 that Davis turns to Lee and puts him in charge. What is, for, what is Lee's first instinct. It's, all right, we've got to prepare the defenses of Richmond. So it's dig, 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 trenches, trenches, trenches. That's where he gets this nickname, king the King of Spades. Huh. But all the time that he's giving these orders about constructing defenses, he's also planning how to hit hard at the Union Army, which is steadily encircling Richmond. Uh, when he has his first staff meeting with his subordinate commanders, uh, one of them starts uh, giving a long list. Oh, this is what the number is. This is what the odds are against us. Uh, the Union Army has so many soldiers. We have so few. And Lee erupts. He says, if you start calculating, if you start doing this according to the numbers, we're whipped already. Uh, he wants to go on the offensive. And when he does, he takes the Union Army, in this case, under the command of George McClellan, so totally by surprise. Mm -hmm. And he hits them not just once, he hits them repeatedly over seven days at the in the last week of June 1862. Where does where does Lee get the template for that? And I think the answer it, it actually lies very uh, clearly on the ground. He gets it from Winfield Scott and the Mexican War campaign. Mm -hmm. Because what else was Winfield Scott's campaign? from the coast at Veracruz all the way up to Mexico City, but this relentless, constant movement. You hit the enemy and hopefully the enemy will disperse. If, you, if he doesn't, then you move around it and you keep on going. And Scott pushed all the way up to Mexico City, kept hitting, kept attacking. What he did was what we can call the continuous offensive. Well, Lee, Lee is his right-hand man during that campaign. So that when Lee actually has to take command around Richmond in 1862, he simply does what he has observed Winfield Scott having done in 1847, and that is continuous offensive. Get your enemy, knock him off balance, keep him off balance. It won't matter what the numbers are. If you've got the momentum and you've got the initiative, you're going to defeat him. He takes that same philosophy into campaign after campaign after campaign. It's not because he's got some, some mysterious thing wrong in his brain that all he can think about is, is how to go on the offensive. It's that he realizes this is the way to win, especially against the odds. Mm -hmm. Go on the continuous offensive. So the, the, the title that he's hung, that's hung around his neck in the first several weeks of his command around Richmond, this King of Spades thing, people forget that very, very quickly after what becomes known as the Seven Days Battle at the end of June, 1862. From that point on, Lee is always going to take the offensive whenever he possibly can. Thank you, thank you, very enlightening.
appreciate that. You drawn a great picture of the, the sort of the complicated versus complex figures of uh, Lee and Lincoln. Uh, where do you see Grant? Uh, you, you didn't list him with the simpletons, uh, uh, but you didn't link him to one or the other either. People have asked me, are you thinking about writing a biography of Grant? And I'd probably be in a better position to answer that question, Don. Uh, if, if I had actually undertaken some serious work on Grant. I haven't. The basic reason is that so many other people have. There have been, there have been at least eight freestanding biographies of Ulysses Grant in the last 35 years, the most recent being Ron Chernow's biography. Each one of those biographies has gotten bigger. I mean, Chernow's weighs in at over a thousand pages. And that's the kind of thing that makes me think, do I really want to do that? No, <laughs> I don't want to join the pack. One of the great things about Lee was that there had really been no good freestanding biography of Lee since 1995. And then before that, really nothing of substance before um, Douglas Southall Freeman in the 1930s. So I felt I had a lot more latitude. With Grant, yeah, that's the, too much of the ground has been tromped into mud, so to speak. So it's, it's a little bit dicier for me to offer an estimate about Grant this way. What I will say though, is that I think Grant deserves much more credit than he's been given. Uh, Grant is often depicted as this mindless butcher who just feeds bodies into the war machine to grind down the outnumbered Confederates. Now that's really a serious exaggeration. And I suspect it's, it's an exaggeration that's largely generated by Southern lost causers who were looking for some excuse uh, to explain why they lost. Uh, Grant actually, Grant's army in the Overland Campaign of 1864 actually sustains less in terms of percentages, less in the way of casualties than Lee's does. Lee is far more aggressive that way than Grant. Grant is, is a much more calculated thinker, much more of what I'd call a kind of five tool military player, because he's, he's good at strategic thinking, but he's also good at tactical thinking. And what's even more, he's good at operational and logistical thinking. I mean, you, a great general usually can achieve greatness with one of those. And occasionally you'll get a great commander who's got two, but it's very rare when you get a great military commander who's got all three of those, along with a few other things. And Grant had those. What makes Grant more difficult to interpret is the man was not flamboyant by any stretch of the imagination. I remember years ago that John Leo once made this comment about Grant, that Grant was the sort of person whom when you met him, the first thing out of his mouth was likely to be, meet the wife. Now he just, there, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of color in, in Ulysses Grant. A part of that is because he suffers from an almost congenital humility. He's never the kind of person who wants to push himself to the front. He's also not a person with dramatic flair. Uh, there, there's a wonderful story about Grant that at one point, you know, he's coming home to visit his parents. This is during the war going to pay a visit home. Well, his father sends a carriage to the train station to meet his son. An hour or so later, his father looks out the window and there's his son walking up the road, carpet bag banging on his thigh. The carriage driver had missed Grant because it, he was looking for this famous general and Grant just didn't look like him. <laughs> um, when, when Grant comes to Washington, uh, for the first time during the Civil War uh, in, in, in March of 1864. Uh, he's, he has his son with him and he checks into, into the Willard Hotel. Well, the Willard Hotel was where everybody in Washington was. Uh, that's where we get the word lobbyist from, by the way, people who inhabited the lobby of the Willard Hotel. 
Well, Grant shows up there and walks up to the, the, the hotel desk and the clerk at the desk looks at him Then Grant says, well, I'd like to have a room. Oh, he says, well, we're, we're really filled up. We do have a room up on the sixth floor, but you know, you'll have to climb to get to it. And Grant says, oh, that'll do. So the clerk turns the uh, registration book around, Grant signs in, U.S. Grant and son. The clerk turns around, looks at it, General Grant, oh, we have a suite reserved for you. you know, the problem was that he just did not look like some famous general on a white horse, like Napoleon with his hand tucked into his vest. Grant just didn't look like that. Uh, he, was, he was a remarkably unassuming person. So lacking that kind of dramatic flair, it's easy to underestimate Grant. And yet, as a general, his, his conduct is just remarkable. He's one of the greatest military uh, commanders in American history. And I would go so far as to say that his role as president deserves much more credit than he is given. In a lot of ways, I think that Ulysses Grant, and I wrote an article about this for the Grant uh, Bicentennial last year. Ulysses Grant is really the first civil rights president in American history, because you look at Grant's record during his presidency, his advocacy of black civil rights, especially of voting rights, his, he breaks the Ku Klux Klan in South Carolina. Uh, he is an advocate that way. Does he receive, receive credit for it? No. And, and I think that's a, a real historical deficit. Uh, we greatly underestimate Ulysses Grant. And I think that that is a serious, serious mistake. I think he's an interesting person on his own terms. I think he deserves much more in the way of the laurels that perhaps we, we put on the brow of too many others who don't deserve them nearly so much. That's great. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Other questions? I have a question. In, in your research, which I'm, I'm astonished how considerable it must have been, what was the biggest surprise you came upon? The father. The biggest surprise, it, it was sort of like that Sherlock Holmes story, um, Silver Blaze, about the dog that doesn't bark in the night. And that was the giveaway for Holmes. You know, the dog didn't bark. Why? Because the person who was uh, trying to rig this uh, with the horse, the racehorse, was known to the dog. The dog didn't bark. Well, for, for a long time working with Lee and Lee's papers, I, I really was at sixes and sevens trying to understand this man, Lee. I had a friend uh, from Texas, no less, who would from time to time put the question to me, have you figured him out yet? And the answer I kept giving was no. And, and one day it, it struck me very forcibly. I'm working on all this Lee correspondence. And I was saying to Lisa before we began, Lee was a compulsive letter writer. He would write four and five letters a day. And over the course of his life, he writes something like about six to 8,000 letters. In all of that correspondence, until 1868, he never mentions his father. His father is one of the most famous figures out of the revolution. When Lee is introduced in the years before the Civil War, at least, it's always in terms of Robert E. Lee, the son of Light Horse Harry Lee, never mentions his father. I thought, that is really peculiar. That's the dog that doesn't bark. And that was like the little crack in the teacup that, that opens the whole vista. And it was from that moment I felt, oh, all right, all right, I think I begin to get a handle on what's going on in the man's life. But it was really that moment. It was a moment of realizing absence rather than discovering something unusual or peculiar in his correspondence or in his military records. No, oh, thank you. And then one other quick question. If if, if Lee had one decision to take over again that would have been most significant, is there one? I think there is. I think he would have revisited the decision to go to Richmond on April 22nd, 1861. 
I think if he had revisited that decision, his conclusion would have been simply to resign from the army and to adopt what we might call a neutral position. This was not necessarily uncommon for a lot of Southern officers at the beginning of the Civil War. I mean, there are a lot of people, I mean, parallel to Lee, there's someone like Alfred Mordecai, who was a high, he was a major in the United States Army at the outbreak of the Civil War. He's from North Carolina. He was, and even more remarkable, he's one of the few Jewish officers in the United States Army at that point. He cannot reconcile joining the secession movement with the loyalty he believes he owes to the United States. He's taken the oath. So what Mordecai does is to resign from the army and participates neither with the Union or the Confederate forces. In fact, Mordecai relocates temporarily to Mexico and there takes up a job as, uh, as a senior officer in one of the Mexican railroads. Hmm. Um, Lee, I think if he had to do it again, Terry, he probably would have decided to adopt a neutral position. Uh, he would have resigned from the army and served neither the Union nor the Confederacy. And if he had done that, I probably would not be writing a biography of Robert E. Lee. And most of us would, if we knew the name Robert E. Lee, would know it only as a footnote to the genealogy of Light Horse Harry. Thank you. Other questions? I would like to ask one more if we have time. Um, there is someone who got pretty close to Hilton Head. Any comments on Sherman and, and the significance of his march through Georgia and South Carolina? Oh, my. Uncle Billy Sherman. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherman has all the color and fury that is absent from Grant. I mean, Grant and Sherman are this kind of yin and yang. They complement each other so well. I mean, Sherman once made the comment about his relationship with Grant that Grant stood by me when I was crazy and I stood by him when he was drunk, <laughs> and, which was which, which is actually true in both cases. I mean, Grant did have an alcohol problem. Huh. He, he was in the strict clinical use of the term. He was an alcoholic. Now he knew that he was aware of his own weakness that way, but he was an alcoholic. That doesn't mean that he was over the moon every time he sniffed a cork, but it did mean that there was a difficulty here and he did have lapses. All right, Sherman has a nervous breakdown at the beginning of the Civil War. So yeah, they did, they looked out for each other. Sherman, I mean, wow. if Grant is the sort of person who is taciturn and it's difficult to get him to talk, Sherman is a fire hose that you can't shut off. Uh, Sherman is aggressive, he's talkative, he's fidgeting, he's, he, he looks like he's always on the verge of a nervous explosion of some sort. And yet the two work together so fabulously. Uh, it, it, the closest thing you can compare it to in the Civil War is, is Stonewall Jackson and Lee. Sherman undertakes this dramatic march to the sea after the fall of Atlanta to Sherman's campaign in 1864. Sherman makes this proposal to Grant and to Lincoln. I want to stage a march straight across Georgia from Atlanta all the way to Savannah. What, what strategic or tactical good is that going to accomplish in military terms? Sherman said none, none whatsoever. However, if I can march from Atlanta to Savannah without encountering any serious opposition from the Confederate forces, that's going to be like stomping right across the abdomen of the Confederacy. It'll show that the Confederacy is kaput. And Grant authorizes it. And Sherman organizes this great march. Now, in, in the memory of, of Georgia and Georgians and the lost causers, uh, Sherman's march is, is an atrocity on, uh, on an order uh, with, with Hitler's invasion of, uh, of, of Russia in 1941. Was it really like that? The answer, of course, is no. Uh, several years ago, uh, another historian, Ann Sarah Rubin from University of Baltimore, 
University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, wrote a book about Sherman's March in which half of it was her account of actually going to Georgia, getting in a car and driving along the routes that Sherman's troops followed from Atlanta to Savannah. She's driving along and she keeps noticing these big old antebellum mansions. And she's thinking, wait a minute, those were all supposed to have been burned by Sherman. Why are they still here? Well, the answer is they didn't burn them. Uh, Sherman himself is probably responsible for some of the reputation he gets about the, uh, the march to the sea. Because in his memoirs, which are, his memoirs are wonderful to read, but you have to read them carefully because they can be a little loose with some of the, the facts. He estimates that his army destroyed something like $21 million worth of property in Georgia. And $21 million, that was a lot of moolah in 1864. Uh, I, I was surprised at this. I went looking back through the old almanacs about state-by-state -state figures on the value of property. There was only about $21 million worth of evaluated property in the entirety of Georgia, according to the 1860 census. He, could, he didn't destroy it all. He was spinning that out of thin air when he wrote it in his memoirs. But it's so sensational, everybody quotes it without reflection. They assume that he knew what he was talking about and that he meant what he was talking about. But he was making that up. He didn't, he, Sherman's March was not nearly this destructive, um, you know, a scorched earth campaign across Georgia. And the reason is because that's not what he was trying to do. The point he was trying to make was, I can march across Georgia and the Confederate government is powerless, impotent to stop me. And that would indicate to Southerners all across what was left of the Confederacy, that they really had no prospect of winning the war. That was, that was the point. And he marches to, he, there's no serious battle that's fought. Uh, the only opposition that he encounters is, is from odds and ends of militia. But the serious, the really serious statistic is this. There is not one record of a civilian casualty in the path of Sherman's march. Hmm. Now you stack that up against the image that you get, for instance, from Gone with the Wind. And there the image, oh, this was a, this was a horrendous event. Uh, when you take it on its own terms and you examine it as it actually unfolded, Sherman's March turns out to be a very different kind of event. And it's not, it's not the kind of thing that the lost cause wizards want to make it into. Uh, you know, to the contrary, Sherman, Sherman actually had experience as a lawyer. And there, there's a wonderful moment during the siege of Atlanta when the Confederate general in charge, John Bell Hood, writes Sherman a letter of protest for Sherman bombarding the city. And Hood is, is protesting and saying, well, this is, uh, you're bombarding civilians, you're inflicting civilian casualties. Now, Sherman writes back to him and says, no, 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 there's no record of that. This is a strategic target. You are the people who have turned Atlanta into a military installation. And what's more, by the laws of war, this is a perfectly legitimate object for me to turn my artillery loose on. And he ends the letter with three words, see the books. Now, what he means for Hood is, go read the treatises on international law, and you will see that this is a perfectly legitimate thing for me oh. to do. Sherman had read them. So he could cite these back to John Bell Hood. That's, again, this is not the image of William Tecumseh Sherman, the avenging angel. You know, this is, again, William Tecumseh Sherman, very intelligent, very talented commander, who, in fact, will write to the mayor of Atlanta. Your problem is that your people decided to raise their hands against the government. And I am here to enforce the government's rule. Hmm. The moment that you surrender, I will share my last cracker with you. It's a wonderful letter. It's very colorful, very typical of William Tecumseh Sherman. Hmm. Oh, that was fascinating. Thank you. Well, Lisa, I'll, I'll tell you one last quick story. Okay, because I feel like we've taken a All right. bit of your time. Here's, here's a great one. A group of Confederate prisoners are rounded up by Union soldiers during Sherman's march. <laughs> and they say, well, we were trying to obstruct Ewan's, 
we were going to blow up that railroad tunnel. And Sherman's men, who, who refer to him affectionately as Uncle Billy, Sherman's men say to him, oh, don't you know, Uncle Billy carries a spare tunnel around with him. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, on behalf of the club, thank you so much for this wonderfully entertaining, insightful, and educational moment. Um, this has just been fantastic for all of us. As I said the Civil War, Hilton Head was very important in the Civil War, and there's a lot of interest here. Um, and you've done just a, a, a fantastic job presenting well, Robert E. Lee and answering our questions. Well, so, thank you very much. And, and I will say on behalf of the James Madison program at Princeton, uh, we're always grateful for the support and the encouragement that we receive from Princeton alumni. Uh, we have we we do a we do a great work through the Madison program at Princeton, and uh, with uh, the help and encouragement that all of you provide, we will keep on doing that. And I have one humble role to play in it through the courses that I teach and the programs uh, that uh, that I run at Princeton. So I invite your interest, all of you, in uh, in the work that we do there at Princeton. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, everybody. And um, and we can sign off or if you want to stay in chat for a few minutes, that's fine, too. <laughs> <laughs>